Shall we uh, begin with our first segment of Absolutely. the entertainment burrito? Yes. Thank you, Jean Grey. Thank I shall. You all have a uh, we are going to start with one of my favorite things uh, to have come out of Joko Cruise, and that is a segment that we call Worst First Page. We started a couple of years uh, ago on Joko Cruise. Jean Grey has contributed some of the most stellar work oh, in the canon. I love it so much. The conceit is this. It's very simple. We ask a number of people to write an intentionally terrible first page to an awful book that doesn't actually exist. Then we have them come out on stage and read them aloud. Uh, so I would like to bring out all of our readers. Are you all uh, assembled and ready to go? I believe so. Great. Uh, please welcome your worst first page authors for this evening. Uh, oh, I have the order. I wrote the order on a different piece of paper, so I'm just going to call them as they come here. Mary Robinette Kowal, Charlie J. Andrews, Alexandria Petri, Matt Chapman, and appearing in exhibition, Jonathan Colton. So I wrote the order on a different piece of paper than the one that was in my pocket. Which one of our authors is like Mary Robinette Kowal! with some mind squelchingly excessive anecdote of badassery and unexamined allegory, probably including 12-headed sea monsters, improper medical use of recreational drug paraphernalia, 
a dashing escape from the roof of a burning megastructure, and some pointedly clever final sleight of hand, all of it laced with bodaciously beautiful banter. So please worry not, dear editor. I will come up with something that fits here long before the printer deadline arrives. <laughs> Editor's note, author failed to come up with something else by deadline. <laughs> that was an incredible tale I just told, to be sure, but just another day to me. And now you are no doubt asking, who is this parasailing paragon of gallantry and ga gaudy gallimaufry? Who is this beautiful, suave lady adventurer? And what is the least creepy way for me to stalk her? And <laughs> Tragically doomed attempt to learn how to emulate her in all things. Well, pull up a chair, scoot closer, and allow me to introduce myself. My name is Gaydar. <laughs> yes, that Gaydar. Gaydar the Unstoppable. Gaydar the Gratuitously Glamorous. I am she, that multiverse famous cyber wizard monster thief assassin. Which you no doubt are aware means that I assassinate cyber wizard monster thieves, who <laughs> are indeed the most dangerous prey. I hang around in virtual reality vice dens, where the modems are full of potions and the avatars are more eldritch than a million elder snake gods. <laughs> Terrible places where anybody who is caught simultaneously in the reflection of two pairs of mirrored sunglasses risks being pixelated forever. <laughs> I eat danger for breakfast, unless the danger includes shellfish, because allergies. <laughs> These cyber wizard monster thieves are an existential threat, which existential threat means a stench that shall exist for all times. Because we believe in pure free enterprise and they believe in crony capitalism, which means capitalism that has been cursed by an evil crone. <laughs> That's what that means. People everywhere rely on the ferocious cunning of Gaydar to save them from losing their savings in elaborate magical fishing schemes. I wield my twin enchanted blades, which I named Dodd and Frank. I to use an infinite causal loop to exploit the carry interest deduction. On this note, the rest of this manuscript devolves into a lengthy discussion of loopholes in financial regulation and the vicious horrific space that lurk in the crevices of the schedule C1, apart from the one brief fight scene on page 549. <laughs> Ronaldo, when 
Rinaldi used to talk to me. I hoped that Rinaldi had merely been the name of the person that I had been reminded of, but there was no internet in space. <laughs> the George went out of the cafe because they did not serve George like him. I wish that I could do the same to adverbs. <laughs> God, I hated adverbs. <laughs> A friend of mine had died miserably because of an adverb. If it had not been for the adverb, he would just have died. <laughs>
also like to read the very same story. I think you'll enjoy it much better this way. This is called The Wall of the Corn. I got a nice little 11-year-old girl named Ida Chapman to read it for me earlier today. Oh, why did she wrote it and read it? The aliens came at midnight. Brain see alien stuff and alien junk. What aliens they were. Then they make wise examples. They're all really funny. You should see my neighbors. We want to make wise. The president of the United States heard about this and, thinking it was fiction, cracked a joke about it on live TV. I believe this show was called Couches Are Real Fun to Sit On. <laughs> he was probably eaten. Or had no earth to talk besides the corn plants, who, having grown sentient, gelatinized the leader. <laughs> the aliens declare war on the corn! Isn't that great? The end. <laughs> Our last author this evening, uh, this is uh, considered appearing in exhibition. Uh, we've, we've taken this concept and we expanded it some at San Francisco Sketch Fest the last couple of years. Uh, we call it Worst First Chapter, where we have a little more room to work. Uh, and this past January we did one, and Jonathan took part and did what may be, certainly is one of my two or three favorites of anything that's ever come out of this dumbass idea. Uh, so I asked if he would uh, come and read his Worst First Chapter for you. Jonathan Coleman. This is a little conceptual. A novelization of Billy Joel's greatest hits. Where each chapter is one song. Starting with Piano Man. Chapter 1. Piano Man. Saturday, 9 o'clock. Everybody walks into this bar the same way, with a kind of shuffle step. I recognize all of their faces because they're the same crowd of people who come to this bar every Saturday. You might say they're regulars, or at least regular attendees of my piano playing sessions. I'm a man, by the way. It's my job to play the piano here. Let me tell you some stories about some of these people and their names and histories. <laughs> For instance, last night I was sitting at the piano bench like always and I noticed someone next to me was some old man literally sitting right next to me on the piano bench. It was a little intrusive. He had a gin and tonic, which is normal, except that I could tell the proportions were off. It was like there was just a little tonic in it and a lot of gin instead of the other way around. Instead of a gin and tonic, I'd call that drink a tonic and gin. I joked to myself in my head. The other weird thing is that he had his penis out and was kind of rubbing it on his drink. You get all kinds in here. And then he asked me a question and we both forgot all about his penis. Son, he said, can you play me a memory? I'm like, what? I explained that I only play songs. And he said it was just a metaphor. So there was a brief misunderstanding there, but then we were on the right track again. He explained that there was a song that he knew, but he wasn't sure how it went. He described a little how sad and sweet it was. Honestly, it could have been anything. He's like, 
I knew the whole thing when I wore young people clothes. But that didn't help me any. So I sang a little old-timey tune with a bunch of lottie dolls, and that seemed to shut them up. Later, I was talking to John, who works at the bar. He's a friend of mine, and sometimes he gets me free drinks, which is a nice plus. <laughs> I hope you know the, all of the lyrics to this song. The other great thing about John is that he's always telling great jokes. He's got a million of them. Also, if you're holding a cigarette, he's always very fast to light it for you. On this particular night, he seemed to be feeling a little blue. He was smiling one second, and then the next, no smile. As if his smile had just literally run away from his face. <laughs> Bill, he said, I believe this is killing me. I asked him to explain more. And he told me that he was pretty sure he could be a movie star if he could just stop working at the bar. I guess he couldn't stop working there for a lot of personal reasons. Exactly. <laughs> Let's see, who else? <laughs> There's a guy named Paul, he writes novels, but about real estate, I think? <laughs> One time I asked him why he wasn't married, and he joked, I don't have time for that, funny guy. <laughs> and of course there's David, but everybody calls him Davey. He's in the Navy, and we all make fun of him. Davey's in the Navy because it rhymes. He hates it. But he really likes being in the military, and honestly, I can't imagine him ever doing anything else. There's a waitress there. She's sort of a politician, if you know what I mean. Of course, a lot of businessmen come in and get drunk together. When you think about it, they're just work friends. And even though each one of them has their own drink, they're also sort of sharing a kind of loneliness which in a poetic way is maybe like a drink for your brain or your heart that you share. What the heck am I talking about? Anyway, <laughs> it's nice that they have friends with them at this bar, even if they are just work friends, because it's better than the alternative, which is being by yourself at a bar. For some, it's a very long song. For some reason, for some reason, Saturdays are really dead here at this bar. But not last night. The manager was there and he smiled at me. I took that to mean that he was pleased at how my piano playing was attracting customers to the bar. So they can forget about their awful lives while they're drinking and hearing the piano. Sometimes when I'm playing the piano really loud, it sounds kind of like a carnival. It's a pretty fucked up piano. It's a My one complaint is that they never wash the microphone because I'm always drinking beer and then spitting all over it when I sing and starting to sink a little bit. But it's a good job. Everyone sits there and listens. And sometimes they put money in a little jar I have on top of the piano in exchange for my piano playing. And they ask me what I'm doing there. Not in a mean way, like, what are you doing here? But more like, boy, you're too good of a piano player to be playing at this bar. I take it as a compliment anyway. So, that's my job, and also a few interesting anecdotes about some of the people who come into the bar where I play the piano. <laughs> All of this inspired me to write a poem, and I think it pretty much captures how I feel about my job as a piano player in a bar. It goes like this. Sing us a song, Mr. Piano Man. Sing us a song, we said. Because we all need to sing at the piano bar, so we don't feel lonely instead. Thank you. Thank you to all of our world's first authors. Oh, right, sorry. That segment is so amazing. I love that. I, I just, I, 
I unabashedly love that segment. I would sit through four hours. Like that. <laughs> yeah, like uh, writing, writing's always hard. Sitting up to write things is always hard. And then uh, when you asked me to do the worst for big, I was like, write terribly. 